joining today's webinar called uh, Youth Leaders in Action, Advancing Youth Participation in the Global Response to Non-Communicable Diseases. My name is Maria Haaslow and I am a medical doctor working in pediatrics and also the chair of NCD Child. NCD Child is a global coalition championing the rights and needs of children, youth and adolescents living with or at risk of non-communicable diseases. In NCD Child, we're committed to promote, promote and advance meaningful participation of young people in the prevention and control of NCDs, both globally, regionally, nationally, and globally. And as current and future health leaders and advocates, young people play a critical role as agents of change in the non-communicable diseases landscape. And the impact of these young people um, in global health is dependent on the opportunities provided as well as focused capacity building. And providing these opportunities and that capacity building is really critical um, to ensure that young leaders get the chance to effectively participate in policymaking and advocacy efforts, uh, which leads in the, event, in the end to a better health uh, of young people and, uh, and uh, solutions that are more suited for young people as well. And now forums such as the WHA, they represent an opportunity uh, to amplify the voices of youth as they drive transformative change and translate global strategies into action. With this in mind and other forums in global health over the past years, uh, NCD Child launched uh, the NCD Child Young Leaders Program or the YLP. That was actually initiated back in 2019, but now we have had the chance to really get it started. Uh, and it is with the vision of supporting young leaders in sustaining a strong youth voice in the global NCD space. We have created this two year leadership program to provide a platform for youth uh, NCD advocates to push for youth inclusive policies and processes to build on their capacity of essential advocacy skills and to form a network of young leaders for peer-to-peer -peer support. And here on the back of the WHA, we now reflect and believe that young people should be centrally involved in such forums as the WHA, but also beyond as co-creators, designers, implementers of global action uh, for the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. So today's session will be an opportunity uh, to showcase how young people all over the world are already engaged in advocacy initiatives and uh, the impact of these actions within their communities and how forums like the Young Leaders Program can bring young people together and elevate the voices of youth advocates, bring attention to their work and benefit uh, in the entire global health community, we believe. And we hope, of course, that you will uh, join us in this belief after listening to the amazing speakers that we have uh, joining us here today. And the Friends of Cancer patients for their support uh, to make this um, program a reality. And now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Andrew Fale-Lissa. Fale is currently a policy consultant with the Asian Development Bank and an independent uh, director on boards of uh, Diabetes Foundation New Zealand and Leukemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand. And he's also a, a colleague of mine as he is the youth representative on the NCD Child Executive Committee. Fale, over to you. Thank you very much, Marie, and a very good morning to our listeners. Thank you for joining us for this very important conversation. I have the privilege or the honor of moderating today's panel session with our distinguished speakers. And following that, I'll be facilitating a Q&A session with members of the audience. It's a very exciting conversation with very experienced young leaders and partners at the table who are ready to share their skills and experience with us. I'm sure we'll all take a lot of uh, learning away from this discussion. And so without further ado, I would like to move to the agenda for today. We've started, uh, as you can see, by, uh, uh, with introductions and a very warm welcome to all who are in attendance. Uh, that will be quickly followed by a moderated discussion with our young leaders. Uh, that will be followed by uh, a conversation with our partners in, in terms of their perspective from the field. And then that will be um, also followed by a Q&A session with members of the audience. And uh, we will wrap things up with a closing remark at the end of today's session. 
And so we move now to housekeeping. There are two points I want to make. Number one is that this will be recorded and the link will be shared with you afterwards. You are more than welcome to share that content with yourself and with your colleagues. And number two, we invite comments and questions from the floor. Please use the Q&A chat function located at the bottom of the Zoom screen to submit your questions and we will try to address all questions time permitting. The, the key here is that we're all experts in the room, regardless of whether we're on the panel or in the audience, and the more we hear from you, uh, the richer the conversation. So please don't be shy with those questions. We're very, very encouraged by your presence here today. We're moving right along now. Time is of the essence, as they say. And so we're moving now to our eight wonderful young leaders from the Young Leaders Programme for NCD Child. They're now on your screen. They're very dis distinguished in their respective communities with lots of experience, lots of networks, and we'll be hearing from them very shortly. And before we do, I just want to uh, acknowledge, of course, all the, those involved behind the scenes who have helped to make these young leaders who they are today, because it takes a village to raise every child and behind every young leader is a network of other leaders and uh, networks and opportunities, of course, as we know. And so I'm going to introduce our first speaker today. She goes by the name of Anna. And we'll start with the first question. And of course, Anna, Naga. I'm going to get this wrong because my Spanish is terrible. Ana Naga is the advocacy coordinator for Contra Peso Coalition in Mexico. And Ana, in light of the just finished WHA, how do you think youth participation in high level forums such as WHA can benefit young advocates? Hi, all. Thank you so much for this question. And no worries at all about my last name. It is extremely complicated. <laughs> uh, sometimes I even get it wrong myself. But um, I do believe that uh, this is the best way to start today's conversation um, because we are beginning by placing the participation of the young people in decision-making spaces. Um, so I believe that it happens both ways. So the high level forums are the ones that are actually benefiting the most from creating spaces in which the participation of young people is guaranteed. Because um, listening to diverse voices is a need that we cannot longer postpone in the face of the global health challenges that we must face. And we, the young people, are the ones that will live in a world whose decisions are being made today. So why wouldn't we want to participate and make these decisions? But also because we know and we live uh, all the challenges that are occurring in our uh, context. So um, I do believe that young people are having a great impact in questioning and updating unfair practices in the health area. They are promoting all kinds of updates from a human rights and a social justice perspective, which is amazing. Uh, they are demanding political action at the national and international level. But above all, I, I, I really believe that young people are questioning the traditional power structures and who is benefiting the most from them. And of course, that can be seen as a threat for actors such as the main polluting industries, the tobacco products, the alcohol industries, the ultra processed unhealthy food industries, and the decision making makers that are supporting them or that have supported them in the past. But this is only a reflection of the power that youth has. Um, mm. So as far as how we benefit from participating in high level forums, well, I think uh, something that I'm tremendously grateful for is the generosity of my peers. Because young people weave networks and share spaces and share their knowledge with other young people. So it is through this type of participation that we grow in a community, even if we are in different countries. Uh, we position our voices together, but at the same time, we are forming new knowledge networks for other young people because we want more and more voices to rise up and join the conversation. So. That I believe is the main added value of youth participation that we are trying to guarantee the permanence of youth voices in decision making. Muchas gracias. I like what you <laughs> said 
about diversity being the key driver for young people in these high level spaces and that we can hold them accountable for their commitments and their, you know, there's a lot of talk at these high level spaces, but it's often the young people and the minorities, you know, the indigenous communities who are driving a lot of that accountability. And I love also what you said about being creative and radical, you know, young people are famous for that and we can use some of these spaces to kind of implement some new ways of doing things, some new styles of engagement. It's all very exciting for the 21st century. So thank you for bringing some of those issues uh, to the forefront. We move now to Dr. Shakira Junada, who's an independent public health care expert in South Africa and who was closely following the WJ proceedings. Now, Shakira, what are some of the key areas or highlights for you from the WHA 74 for us as youth? And who do you think the NCD space beyond WHA 74 represents the most? So, Paula, thanks for the question and a very good evening. It's South African time, so good evening to everyone who's listening in. I just want to touch a little bit on Anna's question, if I may, just to say, um, you know, a big shout out to NCD Child, because I think I actually got to attend the World Health Assembly in person via NCD Child, and, and that's really gotten the interest into following the proceedings so closely over time. Um, I won't go into too much because a lot of it can, can be found online, but I think for me, there's a couple of key words that came out from this year's World Health Assembly. And the one is hashtag pandemic, hashtag disruption, um, hashtag resolutions, and then hashtag NCDs. And I'm really excited to, to say the hashtag NCDs because I think that's where a lot of traction was made. I think we had such enormous focus on so many different areas. For example, eye health, there was a focus on cancer, on rare and orphan uh, diseases. I don't like the term orphan diseases, but um, there was also a focus on the production of local medicines. And we've seen how that's been very important within the COVID pandemic. Um, and then I think shifting right onto NCDs, I think the big wins for us to, to take forward and I think why I'm excited about this discussion as well is a lot of things or a lot of discussions and commitments happen during the World Health uh, Assembly, but it's what happens after that that's critical. Mm -hmm. And what is it that we're going to build on? And I think there's a couple of things. Um, the global coordination mechanism on NCDs, that's something for all of us to support and look out for, um, and also push accountability for that structure um, moving forward. I think then the resolution on diabetes and the specific focus on insulin and getting price transparency around that, I think that's exciting because the prices of medications are what's affecting people living with NCDs or patients or patients in general. Um, there was some cognizance of oral health. And I think what I found most exciting being an advocate was seeing that interlinkages between diabetes, uh, sugary beverages or sugar um, and the sugar consumption, and then also um, NCDs. And I think that connection is very important because when we're engaging ministries of health, for example, if we don't have the evidence, if we don't have the policy commitment, if someone's not able to link sugar to diabetes, and I'm not joking, about this, um, things won't happen. So I think those are some of the key elements. And I'll end off with, I think, something that struck me a lot. And it struck me when I attended face-to-face, -face, and it struck me last week. Um, and I won't mention countries because it will cause political warfare on this <laughs> very webinar. But I think that there was a discussion on humanitarian settings and what's happening there. And I think when we're talking about the people we represent and what we want to do, and that kept me up at night and it continues to keep me up at night because in humanitarian settings, there's been an increase in mental health um, uh, cases or the burden of mental health. There was mm -hmm. an example given of where roads to the hospitals were even being bombed. And this means access to healthcare was stopped. Um, uh, medications were not able to reach these healthcare settings because of blockades. Um, and then, you know, I think it's really just thinking about the use of weapons and warfare and what this means for long-term conditions as well. 
So I think the, the discussion on humanitarian settings sat on me and sits with me. And, and I hope it's something we can pick up in this discussion as well, because it's very likely that, or not even very likely, it's definite that many patients living with NCDs don't get the services and the care that they need in these settings. Thank you very much for that, Shakira. It was quite a nice extension from what Anna said earlier about young people in high level spaces and rather than just attending, but actually what are we doing after we attend and how do we hold uh, those spaces accountable for what they promise. I liked your point about access as well, access to healthcare, access to affordable healthcare, access to humanitarian support, especially. We know that when there's a crisis, healthcare is one of the first barriers um, for recovery. So thank you for bringing so much of that key messaging to the forefront, because it's not just about what we do in these high level spaces, but what we do as a result of them. And globally, young people are driving a whole lot of systemic change in NCD prevention. And one of them is here on the panel today. And he goes by the name of jo Joab Wako, Executive Director for Transplant Education Kenya. And he's going to walk us through one of his personal experiences in NCD prevention. So Joab, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Fale. And I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good night to everyone. I'm gonna take you briefly through a journey to advocacy. So I'm a young person living with an NCD and my journey started in 2015. I'm an industrial engineer and I was working full time and I suddenly felt unwell. And at the time I thought it was something really small and I'd be back on my feet because the symptoms were fairly common. I, I had fatigue, loss of appetite and I couldn't sleep. And in fact, I was misdiagnosed twice before I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease because I was young and I looked healthy. So by the time it was discovered that it was chronic kidney disease and I needed dialysis, I basically crash landed on stage five because of five stages, five stages to chronic kidney disease. It was overwhelming and I did not want to talk to anybody. And I, I believe young people living with NCDs face unique challenges because you're so young and you're still trying to figure out yourself and then you're dealing with an NCD. But my sister, who is my donor, I got a kidney from her, she encouraged me to talk about my story publicly. And it started with blogging, something really simple. I decided blogging about my experience on dialysis as I got the transplant. And I got a really good response from my friends and it expanded beyond my friends. So I decided to found Transplant Education Kenya and that's where my journey in advocacy and raising awareness began. And I was able to connect to the community with chronic kidney disease and as well expand my connections. And it helped me not feel so alone. I, I believe a lot of young people living with NCDs feel alone and feel like they're going through it themselves. So it was really important for me to get that community. And through the community, I was able to connect with the local chapter of the NCD Alliance here in Kenya. And at the time they were working on the advocacy agenda, which I was really grateful to be on. And we were able to roll out the advocacy agenda here and really reach out to people living with NCDs beyond young people. So through this work, I was able to connect with other global uh, organizations like NCD Child and WHO. And that was basically my launch towards global advocacy and the response to NCDs. So as I conclude, I'd like to say that young people living with NCDs, we face unique challenges as Shakira and Anna have said, and it's so important for us to speak about it. The voice, our voice as young people living with NCDs is at the center of the response. So it's important for us to speak about our story, speak about the experiences we've gone through and at all levels, it doesn't have to be at a high level because for me, it started with my friends and my family and it just expanded and expanded. So speaking about it and getting the courage to, you need your support. And that can lead to these spaces where speaking is not only therapeutic for me or for you as an individual, it kind of expands and opens up spaces I didn't know about. So I was able to tell my story and tell out my story in a way that has an impact, hopefully. So that was my journey to advocacy, Pali. And yeah, I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you. Uh -huh. I think we're all very grateful to hear your story. You're such a natural storyteller. And you raise a good point about capturing some of our lived experience of NCDs and being able to share that, not only in these high level spaces, but in all spaces. 
You also touched on the fact that you had support from your family who encouraged you to capture those stories and your peers who, you know, shared them. And the value of that peer support network when we're in advocacy, it can often feel lonely when we don't have access to those networks and what they can do for us in terms of amplifying those stories and that shared experience. So thank you very much to, for being very upfront about your experiences with us today. We move now to someone with lived experience of diabetes who's currently pursuing a master's degree at Harvard University, only the best in the world. Her name is uh, Puva Gamba, and she's here today to speak about her experience in evidence-based advocacy and how Harvard has helped transition her into a new space of advocacy. Over to you. Thank you so much. I, uh... And I just wanted to move ahead by how I'm inspired by Joab's story and how yeah. he brings about the personal perspective of our youth voices into the picture because we all have stories. And what is essential when it comes to evidence-based is how we articulate those stories because we all are so unique with our own stories. And it's important for us to articulate so that we become a voice on the table when it comes to decision-making. So um, uh, talking about... Uh, pivoting from what Joab said that uh, like there is something that drove him to talk about uh, his story and bring into the advocacy picture was that he wanted to not be alone and I think pivoting from that I uh, can share my personal perspective about as a person living with type 1 diabetes how I was inspired to carry this forward because as a medical doctor in India while I was seeing patients with type 1 diabetes I saw that there were so many children who were often just ignored and they didn't have access to either like education or what to do. So they often landed up in uh, early complications. And that's when I realized that this is an area which I really need to pursue because if we as privileged people would not voice uh, about uh, the challenges as a person living with type one diabetes, then who else will? So that actually drove me to this and that's where the evidence-based advocacy comes into picture. So uh, I just wanted to uh, like uh, talk about a little, little about what advocacy means uh, because advocacy has been long uh, prevalent since like a very long time since the AIDS epidemic. Uh, but now it's been now integrated into a lot of other uh, things like non-communicable diseases because we are facing the double burden of the disease. And it's important to have lived experiences because that's only how we would know uh, what what happens in a daily life of a person living with any chronic condition. So I think uh, that's where the evidence base comes from. My journey in the Young Leaders Program started way back when I was in medical school, when I wanted to understand what advocacy is. And that's why what is crucial when it comes to any uh, story being articulated well is that we need young leaders' stories to be well articulated and for that we need proper training into the advocacy field like I received a uh, training from T1 International on how I can articulate my story well and bring into the uh, policy forefront so people the stakeholders can actually address and listen to my key points so I think that's what I wanted to bring into picture and um, uh, over to others because we all have stories which are very unique and uh, that's how we will be able to create the real impact in the policy forefront. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've raised a good point about, you know, authenticity and the value of lived experience in advocacy. So people with diabetes becoming experts in the field and then shaping their recovery and shaping the experience based on how they've come through. And, um, you know, that's very, very important because often you have people acting on our behalf who haven't really had the same experiences as us. So validating that lived experience and giving it a life of its own is very, very important. Just a friendly reminder to our audience to submit your questions. Uh, for our discussion afterwards. But before we do that, we're going to move now to a conversation about data and what data can tell us in terms of trends, in terms of challenges and opportunities, in terms of the risks going forward for NCD prevention.
And to do that, we talk to a PhD candidate in Barbados who goes by the name of Stithany. And she's uh, studying right now uh, evidence-based advocacy from a data perspective. What are the numbers telling us, Stephanie? And what are the gaps in academia or research, particularly for young people in the NCD space? Stephanie Whitman. Hi, Fali. Thank you so much for the question. This is an area that I hold very dear to my heart. And I know I am known amongst the NCD um, child group as the data geek. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, enjoy, I'm enjoying this question. So only about 87% of the world's youth live in developing countries. And yet the majority of youth led and youth involved research happens in just a handful of developed nations. And this is even shown in the top 10 countries for the Youth Development Index are all come from these developed or high income countries. And though what, did, what tends to happen is that the youth led research and youth led interventions happen and are first done within these developed or high income countries. And then they then trickle down to be implemented in the lower income or middle income or, develop, or developing nations. And we tend to try to adapt those interventions that were created in the developed countries and implement them in the, our developing countries. And that is all well and good. And it is fantastic that at least some youth-led research is happening, but it's not enough. And every context is different. And the experiences of youth in research in these developed countries of may be different and are very different from those experience in developing countries. And therefore, one of the first gaps is that there is a need to encourage more youth-led and youth-involved research in developing countries. Another point that I will say is that during, sorry, is that um, even though these programs and interventions or research might be done, there is a need for more research done in program evaluation of these interventions and research and of the policies and interventions that are implemented, especially the ones that are geared towards increasing youth participation. And from what I've seen, most pro pro programs, um, if, they do, do, if they do engage in a program evaluation, it tends to be a more of a summative evaluation at the end of the pro program to then see if it's done, if they involved enough youth, and that's not enough. They need to include a process formative a process or a formative evaluation that happens at the very inception of these interventions and of these research pro programs. And that's the only way that I see that we can help include and, and make sure that youth participation is done from the very beginning. Um, before I close out, there's just another point that I would like to make. And it's that from my experience, um, youth led re research and youth participation in research happens way too late in our youth life. And when I say that, persons usually get involved in research, maybe come into their last year of university, which is in their bachelor's, or even worse yet, if they don't do a practicum at the end of their university life, the only involvement they get in research or hardcore research is at the master's or tertiary or doctoral level level. And that happens way too late. Um, I believe that research and in the introduction to research and the academia field should happen way earlier um, to help involve youth participation. And that could happen as early as secondary school or at the high school level. Um, and that could be possibly via schools creating a research club. And it could involve, encourage students to answer the what, how and why questions within their school context and conduct a little mini research studies. And yes, it may not be peer review worthy studies, but it will give them a taste and of the whole research process and make them, encourage them to enter the academia field to encourage more youth within academia. And the last point I would like to say is that data is only as important as this person's interested in it. And if there's, um, therefore it is the need for our adult researchers to perform these assessments on what kind of research is needed and wanted by youth in the first place to encourage them to participate in the research. Because there's no point having all these different research studies going on where no youth is interested in it and therefore they're not going to engage in it. Um, and I will think I will leave it as that, um, Fale. 
Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'll give you a new nickname, Data Queen. <laughs> and I think you've touched specifically on what the ideal situation is for youth engagement. I like to call it best practice. And, uh, you know, it's about involving us from the beginning and not near the end when, you know, most of the work has already been done. As young leaders, we're all familiar with the concept of tokenism and this idea that we don't feel valued as partners or stakeholders. And so the key here is what does authentic youth engagement look like in practice and how can we support it? And, and you touched on the value of research, not only for political change, but also for change uh, as a sector, for change in the business world, for change in pharmaceuticals, whatever it may be. Having data to support your case makes your case more persuasive and more likely to be heard where it needs to be heard. So thank you very much, Stephanie, for such a wonderful presentation. You really are NCD Child's data queen. And uh, I think we're 30 minutes in and we haven't heard the word COVID-19. And so now it's only fair that we mention COVID-19 because we hear this a lot, build back better. But what exactly does that mean in the NCD prevention space? Well, we have two exceptional young leaders here to tell us exactly that. Our first speaker for this particular session is Dina Alzobi, who's a manager uh, for uh, the Royal Health Awareness Society in Jordan. And she will tell us exactly what it means in the NCD context, building back better in a post COVID-19 society. Over to you. Thank you, Fale. I feel very fortunate and grateful to be here among such distinguished panelists. Um, I think we need um, adequate and powerful youth participation in building back the new normal after COVID because Fale, we all know that the old normal was not working. It was not working for the millions of young people who, were, who are still suffering from poverty, malnutrition, preventable diseases and un unemployment among other issues. And we know that this is measurable because uh, we can see that multiple or almost all countries are lagging on the attainment of SDGs uh, um, in several areas and so we need to build back um, differently. Programs like the uh, Young, Leader, uh, Young Leaders Program um, make sure that we as youth have the skills and the practice and the experience to be comfortable with sitting uh, you know, at the table and creating the table where necessary uh, with decision makers to make way for our needs to be uh, realized and to voice our opinions, concerns and demands when it comes to uh, NCDs and not just as near tokenism of, of our youth engagement and involvement. So in countries like mine, Fale, 60%, more than 60% of the population are under 30, but we still have insufficient and inadequate uh, youth representation and leadership and participation. So efforts like this program, they give us the opportunity to build our capacity as youth and really get into a network and have access to network with like-minded youth who are working on uh, similar agendas and similar, uh, um, you know, with similar goals and objectives. So as you can see, my colleagues um, and I, we don't necessarily uh, work in similar settings, but we do face some common challenges and it helps us to, you know, lean back sometimes on each other and learn from each other and, and from, uh, you know, the efforts that everybody is doing in their own countries. Um, these program, this program also, uh, like the Young Leaders Program, it, it gives us or links us to mentors. Uh, so we have a lot to learn from and, and benefit from these mentors as well. And, you know, all together, this gives us a, a great supportive environment and provide us, provides us with a great, you know, surround sound uh, to help us stay motivated and you know bulldoze through driving the change that we need in our communities and our respective countries. Um, we also see that you know a projects like this, um, you know, as you saw from the example of my colleague Anna, um, they open doors to youth to participate and be heard in international conferences and meetings such as the WHA, and uh, uh, it gives us a way to to be heard and to make a way for the real change to happen when it comes to healthcare and health systems in general. Wow, thank you very much, Dina. I like what you said about equity and the fact that the old way wasn't working anyway. So this gives us an opportunity to be more innovative and to be more radical and to, I guess, to challenge or evaluate the old way and uh, to, I guess, propose or replace them with new ways of doing things. Young people do that best. And so this crisis is almost like an opportunity 
And it's important that we don't lose sight of that because, you know, there's real momentum to change now. But what does that look like in the NCD city? And also to answer this question, we have an associate lecturer from the Maldives, Naimul Mohammed, who uh, is the associate uh, professor at National University, uh, the Maldives National University. Uh, over to you for a small island developing state perspective. Although the Maldives is much bigger than most islands, <laughs> but very beautiful nonetheless. Thank you, Father, for the introduction. Um, I just want to add on to what Dina said and agree with uh, all my peers, uh, particularly if we're talking about the build back better uh, uh, in terms of the NCD space or the NCD agenda. Uh, we have to often talk about what the pandemic has shown us. So. What are we trying to build back better in terms of uh, the health infrastructure as well as the health workforce has shown uh, has gone back years and years, uh, and that's why we are saying that we want we do don't do not want to live in, in the uh, old ways and then we are moving on to a new normal which we are building for every one of us. Uh, like you mentioned that uh, I belong to a small island state uh, and. Uh, coming from here and then us being on a global platform or me just being here is uh, showing that uh, what Anna mentioned at the beginning, uh, the diversity of the young leaders group as well. Uh, for us, uh, it's important that all of the uh, different perspective of the uh, global health is showcased and that all our programs are reflective of the challenges faced by the different uh, uh, population groups. Uh, uh, what I've learned uh, from the short experience of the NCD Child Young Leaders Program so far is, has been uh, nothing uh, but exciting as well as looking forward to the uh, amazing projects that our young leaders and my peers are developing. And I would like to tell you all that uh, just uh, I've been also following a little bit of what the uh, post WHA uh, looks like for us. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot of conversation around the uh, focusing uh, back on the SDGs, but uh, with a focus on the child rather than the specific target group. So uh, whenever we talk about the health or chronic diseases, our uh, target group has always been the uh, person living with the disease. Uh, but uh, if we are to, uh, change that or build back better, we need to focus our SDGs as the uh, WHA highlighted back on the child. So we are not leaving anyone and then we are focusing our efforts on early intervention as well. So uh, I'll just uh, stop my discussion over there and say that uh, I've been, uh, we all as the young leaders group are uh, working on innovative uh, ways to reach out to the whole uh, population as a as a one whole society rather than grouping into different uh, parts so that we don't leave anybody time. Thank you. Thank you, my island brother. And it's nice of you to mention as well that it's not enough just to be young anymore. It's also about having you know young people with disabilities, having young people who are indigenous, having young people who live in remote or rural locations. There's a whole lot of layers behind what it means to be young. And sometimes we stop at just young and we don't go any further than that. So understanding some of those privileges we have as urban young people and how do we get more and more young people into these spaces who represent some of those smaller constituencies is fundamental to our work as advocates. I particularly enjoyed your spiel about early prevention and involving children much earlier than we already do because A, it's more cost effective and B, because it's more right. You know, we can't wait until they get older when these chronic illnesses are more severe to intervene. That early intervention must happen a lot sooner than it already does. So thank you for raising two of those very important issues for us as advocates. We move on to a very old friend of mine who's an expert in NCD uh, prevention and, and he does a whole lot of stuff on the ground and we all know him and love him. His name is Pierre Cook. And Pierre, because you're such an expert in the field, if I was starting out and I didn't know quite what to do, what advice or recommendations would you give me and why? 
there's a lot of young people in this room, but they may not know how to get off the ground, how to get started. They may be on their way, but don't know how to elevate their experiences or their advocacy to the next level. So what advice would you give them, Pierre? Uh, thank you very much, Fali, for introducing me. Um, I, I love when young persons are passionate about getting involved in advocacy, particularly around NCD advocacy, because in every conversation that we have that affects the rights of children or the rights of young people, we need to have a young person in the room um, because the action or inactions of our governments, international organizations necessarily affect our future. And I think some of the areas that we need uh, to address is some of the areas that can support us in starting advocacy is building our awareness around the issues affecting the health of young people, particularly around NCDs um, and training youth advocates. I think what hinders some youth advocates from moving beyond the stage of the passion or having the passion to be involved in the conversation around the prevention of non-communicable diseases, the protection of the um, access to, the, to health care services, um, is the lack of training around the space. Um, young persons need to be able to understand that the issues that we are facing now, how they are developed and necessarily where their messages need to be targeted. That's one area. Capacity building and empowerment. Capacity building speaks specifically to the fact that as a youth advocate, we don't want persons being put in a room as, as tokens. What that means is if an international organization, a regional organization, um, requires or wants the expertise of a young person or you as a young person who are looking to be an advocate necessarily need to provide the capacity building opportunities for you to be involved. Um, awareness is the first step, but it needs to be followed by building the capacity and the adaptation skills um, of young people. One of the other areas I think we need to appreciate is our influence or our need to be engaged in decision making. Um, it isn't enough for young people to be advocates alone, but they need to be involved in meaningful ways as a part of decision-making processes. So whether it's a national um, policy advisory team or committee, whether it's an international policy group, young persons need to look for more ways to be involved and engage in decision-making processes. Um, adaptation, I think this is one of the largest and, and more prominent areas that I want to stress. Adaptation is particularly important. What that speaks to is for you to understand and appreciate that Times are changing. Um, the political landscape is changing. Just recently, we had to shift and adapt to the COVID-19 environment. And what young persons need to understand and appreciate is to be able to be fluid with their advocacy so that when there's a major situation like COVID-19, our advocacy doesn't stop. In fact, at that point, our advocacy needs to become stronger than it ever was. What that means is we need to be able to look and, and appreciate political windows of opportunity. What that means very simply is when our governments are in a space of promoting um, increased action around health or even COVID-19, I'll use that as my case example. What we saw is that persons who were living with non-communicable diseases were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So we had higher percentages of deaths among persons who were living with non-communicable diseases. That was a prominent political window of opportunity for us to speak to governments and say, we need increased action now so that if there is a future pandemic, young persons are then protected from being in a position where they're disproportionately affected and disadvantaged by a natural or, or international rather disaster. Um, so awareness um, raising, capacity building, um, skills development and adaptation, I think are the necessary areas that young people need to address and knowing your value and knowing your worth as a youth advocate. Let no one tell you that you're only invited into the room to share you know, one word or one comment Make sure that when you're invited into spaces, you feel appreciated and that there's meaningful engagement for your contribution. Too many times we're asked to step into rooms as tokens, and it's time for us as youth advocates to recognize our worth and only engage in spaces that we know that meaningful action and meaningful conclusions will result. Wow, how do you follow that? Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, from the Healthy Co uh, Caribbean Coalition. And you're the second person from Barbados to speak today. So that just tells you just how experienced people from Barbados are when it comes to NCD prevention. So if you ever need the best case study, Barbados is probably right up there as one of the places where you should go. Now, in terms of uh, alliances and partnerships, we talked about this at the beginning. We can't do what we do alone. 
Instead, we need the support and the guidance of those who have more life experience, those who are more connected, those who have more resources. And so we turn now to our partners or allies in the sector, and we ask them for their experiences with young people. And first up on our list is Luhan from Argentina. And of course, they're a member of the Alianza. I'm going to get this wrong as well because my Portuguese is just as bad as my Spanish. Alianza Juvenal. Uh, so they're the coordinating group, which is part of CLAS. And so to you, in your experience, what has been the most effective way to engage young people in your context? Okay, thank you so much for having me. First of all, it's it's great to listen to all these inspiring stories and, and experiences around the world. So I wanted to say first that like the Alianza Juvenil, it's like the, the Spanish name of it, so it's okay, which in English <laughs> translates to the Youth Alliance. It's, it was almost there, so it's fine. And this initiative <clears throat> comes from the Coalition for the Healthy Americans that is known as CLAS, as, as we tell it in, in Spanish. And it, it is aimed at bringing young people into the conversation about non-communicable diseases and leveraging their power to tackle this issue through political advocacy, awareness, key partnerships and other measures to achieve real change. So the Youth Alliance for Wellbeing and Development, that is the full name, was created at the beginning of 2020 to bring young people from the region together for a campaign on social media for the World Tobacco Free Day in May. And the preparation for this campaign started in March 2020, so it was when, well, when the pandemic was starting, through a small group of people, and now the Alliance has more than 50 young members participating in the space in different ways. So the main motivation that created this, this alliance was to bring together young people of the Latin American region to generate new spaces for reflection, collective creation, social mobilization, youth engagement, empowerment, and leadership. So to do all of that, we have done a couple of, of activities that I'm going to mention now. We have promoted conversations about different topics related to NCDs, including a series of webinars called From Young People to Young People, to share information and experiences about the importance of reducing NCDs in Latin America and other related topics such as unhealthy food environments, smoking, physical activity, the role of, of the industry in this issue. And two weeks ago, we talked about why tobacco companies are still targeting young people. In December 2020, we, we had a two days event in which the Alliance supported a call for action to the Latin American political authorities for the Healthy Americas 2030. We organized and participated in a regional NCDs child workshop uh, along with CLASS and the American Heart Foundation and other partnerships. And we had great conversations about COVID-19 and school environments, and also about how to promote NCDs prevention and control in those spaces. And we're also working with organizations working on the ground in Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. We also submitted a proposal to the NCD labs that is part of the WHO with a project to work with young scientists and researchers to evaluate the advertising promotion and sponsorship and pricing of alcohol. And even though we didn't get the first prize, we were in the runner up list. So we were really proud about that. And we are also working on the Alliance website that will be part of the class website. So that will be another platform to, to engage young people in this conversation. So just to finalize, like we, we are a space for co-creation like, and we work under the umbrella of class and we want to keep building bridges with, with the Latin American youth as a key element for the solution of tackling NCDs in our region and, and around the world. So thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I like what you said about being responsive and proactive rather than reactive, which is very common in the youth space. You know, we react to problems, but, you know, in your space in particular, you're being proactive and you're predicting problems and acting before they even occur. So you're being very strategic about your timing and your allocation of resources, which is very good feedback for those of us who are trying to upscale some of our efforts on the ground. So thank you for sharing some of your secrets on the trade about how to be more effective as young leaders um, even with fewer resources. It's very, very useful for those of us hoping to do more in the field. Next up, we have the uh, World Obesity Federation, and that's uh, the program manager, Margaret uh, from the UK, Nivux, I think is uh, the pronunciation of your surname. I'm sure I butchered it, but I gave it an attempt. And we want to know exactly what you're doing uh, in terms of engaging young people in the obesity space and um, some of the lessons that you've discovered on your journey as well. 
Yeah, hello everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Um, and you did not butcher my name, it was very close, Margot Neveu, um, and I'm the Senior <laughs> Policy Manager at World Obesity Federation. Um, and it's been very inspiring to hear from all of you, all of the youth speakers from around the world, really. So I have to say I'm very impressed. Um, and so recently, World Obesity has really recognizing the role that youth uh, has both in shaping the current environment, but also in recovering from COVID. Um, we have been actively working with youth through different, uh, through different angles of our work. So first of all, WOF is a partner in the Co-Create project, uh, which is a large project funded by the EU Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program as part of the response to address the childhood obesity epidemic uh, across uh, Europe. And so really what this project aims to do is to provide a model on how to involve young people, um, as well as the range of relevant stakeholders um, on the issue of obesity um, by providing very specific obesity related policy proposals, but also by designing and testing a number ad of advocacy tools and strategies. Um, and we do all of that in co-creation with youth um, across different countries in Europe. Um, We've also launched a capacity building platform as part of the Co-Create project and also as part of the STOP project, another childhood obesity project that we work on, um, which is called Healthy Voices. Um, and so that platform is really aimed to provide young people with all the necessary knowledge and tools uh, to promote their positive engagement to address health related challenges. Um, and so what we're trying to do is really to exploit some of the learnings and the findings from both the Co-Create and the STOP project, but also from our broader work at World Obesity um, and seeks to sustain um, positive youth engagement um, across, the, across all aspects of our work. Um, and it's meant to be really an educational and capacity building platform that provides a space for discussion. So uh, through blogs and uh, podcasts, um, but also we provide a few briefings and videos um, with the overall objective to really provide young people with some of the tools and expertise that they need on how to become uh, actively involved in shaping their environment and becoming true agents of change. But what we have seen also is that when we talk about uh, developing and evaluating childhood obesity policies, we really tend to talk about youth rather than talk with youth. Um, and so that's something that World Obesity is really committed to change. Um, and so we are aiming to provide a platform for young people to truly have a voice in everything we do, because what we've seen, what we've heard today is that young people truly are experts of their own lives and nothing for youth should be done without youth. Um, so uh, recently we've held a number of high level stakeholder meetings around childhood obesity, and we've invited young people to participate both as keynote speakers, as moderators, and they've also helped us formulate some of the final recommendations and considerations uh, from these meetings. We've also held a number of uh, webinars, uh, some of which were completely youth-led, um, and a few participants from NCD Child and the Healthy Caribbean Coalition were also featured, um, so that was fantastic. Uh, World WCD also recently participated in the fourth Global Youth Meet on Health, uh, where we hosted a workshop aimed at shifting the obesity narrative um, by sharing a number of guidelines and on the use and of language and imagery when discussing obesity. And finally, I guess one of our most recent and exciting new projects is that we just launched a new podcast called Youth Voices for Healthy Choices, which is a three episode podcast mini series. And it's hosted by a patient and student activist called Faith Newsom based in the US. And she takes us on a journey um, around the world and we are hearing stories from experts and young change makers on how to address childhood obesity. So as you can see, there are a number of activities that World Obesity has been involved with um, recently. We can see that very clearly, Maggie. Thank you very much. I think you've been very, very busy. And I love the energy and the enthusiasm, but also the options that you provide young people. You know, it's, it's one platform with a number of opportunities to engage and you're following up, which is a key point that I want to make. The follow up after the initial youth engagement is often very important. And it's great to see that the Federation is committed to realizing that opportunity in this space. You've been very innovative uh, in COVID, during COVID, and uh, I think that's a credit to the leadership of your organization and to the belief, the inherent belief that having young people across the organization adds value. And I think all of the research would agree with you. We move now to UNICEF, which is no stranger to youth engagement, one of uh, the strongest uh, allies of youth engagement, I would say. Uh, and Dr. Joanna Lau, 
who is a health specialist at the headquarters uh, for UNICEF in New York. Uh, talk us through some of the latest developments at UNICEF, uh, especially under COVID-19. What's going on with UNICEF in relation to young people and NCD prevention in particular? Great. I mean, thank you so much, Fale. It's always eye-opening to hear from different young leaders. And certainly um, from UNICEF's side, we see that working young, with young people, it's a critical part of any solution or action for responding to NCDs. And um, from our side, we've also been working with a group of committed young leaders for the past year. And I kind of just want to highlight three things I've really learned from them, you know, um, and three things that they've really challenged us to do better on that I really uh, think is important. And the first is to be more inclusive in our engagement with young people, to ensure that we're hearing, um, you know, and understanding their experiences, their needs and their ideas, um, and using that to drive our policies. So this year, we put a big push and a big focus on um, interacting with a broader range of young people through our Voices of Youth platform, our um, You Report platform, um, around the topic of NCD risk factors. I mean, we don't we don't usually say NCD risk factor, but you know, in, in their language, in a way that about lifestyle, about the challenges they face, um, you know, different health needs, and I think that that has been a really important thing for us to just listen and to have that kind of dialogue um, and also to connect um, with those who we aren't able to reach through other young leaders. That's something that young people bring to the table a lot is that you're able to reach those we don't normally get to engage with um, who are offline or otherwise. So that's been important to make um, the engagement more inclusive, younger age groups, those who don't normally participate in these spaces, how do we get through and reach them as well and hear from them? The second, um, they've really challenged us on is to be more collaborative. I think for us, you know, working multi-sectorally, but also how we can foster and support them um, to be more collaborative with one another. I think as all of you, you work in this space, you know that um, opportunities for participating, for capacity building, they can be a bit limited. And sometimes that can feel a little competitive. <laughs> um, and so how are we making sure that the opportunities and the way that we we uh, promote these uh, trainings and things are, are in a way that you know, fosters collaboration and broader participation. And so one of the things um, we've been working on is a youth advocacy training. Actually, I shouldn't say we're working on young people develop the training and the training guide and UNICEF has been working with them. And we're looking at how we can expand this more broadly. So you know, invitation to all of you as well, um, how we can train youth, youth trainers, youth networks who can be a resource for their own net organizations, their own communities, and um, other, other people who want to train um, other young leaders in youth advocacy as well. We were able to, I think someone else had also mentioned, partner through Youth uh, Global Meet to do a round of training a couple months ago. So we, we're looking to expand that more. And I think lastly, something that all of you guys have touched upon is the need to be more creative. And I think by creative, we mean um, they've, they've pushed us. It's about being flexible in the way we think, in the way that we do things, um, to be constantly learning and asking how we can do things better. Stephanie, you also mentioned because, uh, I think Dina mentioned it because a lot of the policies and services are not really working for young people. So what are we gonna do about that? And um, it's a definite strength, as you said, Fale, that, that young people bring to the table to be able to think creatively, think out of the box. Um, I think that also means involving artists, musicians, people who might not normally be in this NCD uh, prevention space, how we can invite them in and benefit from what they can contribute. Um, in our last year, we've worked with those artists, musicians, different people who have really helped us bring this topic uh, to, to a broader group of young people. Um, and to Stephanie's point too, we need young people to ask those questions um, that we should be researching and looking um, and pushing that is gonna yield a bigger impact on young people. So collaboration and being more inclusive, being more creative, these are some of the things that uh, we've really learned from the young leaders we've worked with and really look forward to more collaboration with all of you as well. Thank you very much, Joanna. You've also been very busy by the sound of things, and I love that you're taking risks. I mean, in COVID-19 in particular, this is a great way to kind of test out new ideas 
new ways of doing things. I know for myself, there's always been a fear around working with children because of that safety issue. But it's great to see that UNICEF is kind of driving some of that innovation around how do we work with younger members of the community? How do we do that in a safe way? But how do we capture their feedback as well? Because it's just as valuable as the feedback of teenagers and young adults. So thank you for being so brave, UNICEF, uh, in testing the waters in relation to some of those emerging industries and emerging uh, behaviors rather. We move now to some of our partner organizations and uh, some of their activities. And I think the key here, I will start with the American Health Association. You're the Cure Grassroots Youth Driven Tobacco and Game website. It's an example of how youth in the US are empowering young people to identify and reject the harmful impact of tobacco. Now the focus will be on engaging high, uh, young people who are at higher risk of tobacco use and vaping, which is taking off right now. And it's an issue that has been uh, prioritized by the US administration. While, the US -based, uh, while they are US based, there is an opportunity to engage young people aged 13 and over to join the movement and be able to connect directly with policymakers and learn how they can create healthier communities through public policy change and gain important experience as community leaders to voice uh, issues for their peers. This website was made possible through support from the Queso Permanente to promote uh, the site AHA and are utilizing a promotional plan that includes paid social media and direct outreach to youth organizations. They are also exploring a social media influencer strategy that will help raise awareness and build credibility of the site among young people. We move now to Movendi's Summer Leadership Academy for Alcohol Harm Prevention. So it's the world's first ever international summer school for bright young leaders who want to make the lead in transforming student environments by addressing alcohol related harm. So Summer L-E-A-H-P is a unique hub for youth leaders to develop and enhance their skills, knowledge and capacities in leadership, communication and advocacy for better and healthier university environments this is a groundbreaking summer program driven by the students themselves and interactive sessions facilitated by some of the world's leading experts and activists in the field of science, prevention, advocacy, communication, and leadership. We also move now to Movendi's EPICC Sustainability Challenge, which is an innovative platform that brings together young students and experts from different backgrounds and areas of interest to collaborate and address the world's sustainability challenges. Over one day, students meet and network with experts to build skills, confidence, and evidence they need to frame ideas, build a team, and identify opportunities to drive meaningful change. HRI Day's annual Global Youth Meet on Health aims to strengthen the capacity of young advocates, promote youth expert interactions, hone their skills to plan, implement, monitor, and scale up integrated campaigns to promote health and development. They just ended the 2021 session, which had over 650 registrations from young people in over 35 countries, focused on meaningful youth engagement for leading action on universal health coverage and sustainable development goals. Six GYM regional action plans were developed by youth leaders who participated in 20, uh, GYM 2021, which have now been further refined into concrete campaign plans to be implemented over the next few months. Any interested young champions may join the a GYM regional action working groups. The GYM 2021 Youth Declaration was also released during the closing ceremony, which we will include in the chat, along with links to a list of resources of youth-focused initiatives that we have featured here. Awesome. So without further ado, we will move now to the Q&A. Um, so one of the first questions here is um, from John Klein. All of these separate efforts 
each with different NCD prevention priorities and or different meetings. What can be done to bring about sustainable and coordinated efforts to address integrated NCD prevention for people and communities rather than one primary issue? Mm. Go ahead, Pierre. Hey, um, so, so if I just may add, I think what we do find from most of these um, interventions, albeit in different spaces, is that there's normally uh, a final document that's uh, pre prepared and, and finalized. So it may be a call to, na call to action, um, a declaration, it may be a call to governments. Um, I think that building on these documents or looking at what the recommendations were as youth advocates within our individual spaces, we can communicate um, in a very real physical way what we want to see as co coordinated efforts across the, um, across the world. I think also when we look at the World Health Organization's youth advisory group and their team, um, that type of collaboration shows that maybe we should have a streamlined effort where the messages delivered from, for example, HRI Day or the World Health Assembly or other um, international meetings that we have are all streamlined to a single focal point, whether it is directed to the World Health Organization, so that all the recommendations, all our conversations, all those specific projects that we want to see put together, we have in a central location for action. Um, one of the things that we're addressing within the um, Young Leaders Program with NCD Child is the fact that we see a lot of paper recommendations. Um, so at the end of a meeting, there is, um, this should happen for mental health or that should happen for childhood obesity um, without necessarily a supportive framework or actual physical action being um, going on around the issue. What we do need to see then is actual um, interventions being communicated or engaged in after these recommendations are made. So no longer should we stop at, here's a document saying this is what we should do. But beyond that document, we have persons to necessarily take the next step for the implementation, the intervention, and then the accountability um, so that there's not just a single one-stop shop for our messages and our advice but we see continuation of the projects and their sustainability. So that there isn't one single primary response, but with each recommendation, there is increased action. Hi everyone. I, uh, I have just been asked by T to take over the question and answer part as, as long as Fale can't see the questions, but if you can, Fale, just let me know on the and I'll, I'll let you handle it from there. Um, thanks so much for your question, John. And I, I agree with, with Pierre, uh, just to give a few reflections from our side. I believe that, that programs like the Young Leaders Program and, and some of the other initiatives that we've heard from our partners, uh, UNICEF, et cetera, they bring together uh, different youth experts uh, to both learn from each other and, and understand the perspectives um, of both young people living with, but also, uh, experts in, in one field such as tobacco control uh, with uh, another expert in obesity and cancer and so on. So we we are trying to have a, a, a whole entire group, but we will also we are also having group work uh, that are zooming in on some of the, the challenges in uh, in more depth. So that is it is it is a, certainly a balance, and I also hope that the the WHO. I think that's a very important point here is that the WHO Youth Council will hopefully soon be up and running uh, so that we can we can also bring other health challenges together um, so that we don't uh, stick with this uh, NCD, uh, non-NCD or infectious diseases uh, type of uh, um, pillar uh, made uh, global health, which is where we've seen, I mean, during COVID-19, we've seen how interlinked those are and, and, and certainly not um, not separate issues. Um, I'll just take the next question, which is from um, Beatrice Champagne, a, a colleague a, of ours from, from class. And a, any young person or anyone on the panel who wants to answer can just raise their hand. The question is, how do these young leaders think we should address corporate capture of the health agenda? Does anyone? Want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, Lujan. Yes, so I think that's a very important question. And one of the things we can all do, because we can all do something, but sometimes it's like, where should I start? 
is to engage in conversations in social media, just like to mention, for example, the, we know that there are some things going on with corporate capture and the UN Food System Summit. So we can expose that, we can engage in that conversation to, to, pro to like propose alternative solutions like youth left. So that would be my, my first take. Yes, Mago. Yeah, I think just to add uh, to what Lujan just said, um, it, youth, peop youth voices also are very powerful and they can come forward and denounce almost this uh, corporate takeover. Um, so we've seen, we've seen through previous movements, um, through the climate change movement, what youth activism actually has the power to do and has the power to change. Um, and so I think young people have almost a responsibility uh, to really come forward and uh, expose uh, some of these actions. Yeah, I was I was having some of the same thoughts, Mago. I think we, with with young people, um, you know, challenging companies that are greenwashing their products, etc. We've really seen uh, how important uh, youth leaders can be uh, in in creating this change and calling out um, companies that are that are interfering in a negative way. Uh, the next question is from uh, Michelle Farmer. What other ministries can we engage beyond Ministry of Health? I'm thinking of the Ministry of Education, not only for health in schools, but we should also promote education among health professionals concerning obesity. Anna? Thank you. Um, I think that is a great question. And usually we think about obesity or diet related diseases as a matter of the health ministries when in reality, we should be looking at it as a matter of health in all policies. That is, um, all governments from all countries should be involved in guaranteeing nutritious foods for older populations. So of course, that includes the ministries of agriculture, uh, that includes the ministries of finance, because uh, it's not enough just to talk about you know, education or food orientation, but to actually have a budget for it because otherwise it's not gonna be sustainable over time. And um, of course, I do believe that the education stream has a lot to add onto it, um, but we need to think about it more broadly. In Mexico, for example, we have a great problem with the capture of water for private companies. And at the same time, the education systems are giving a message to children about the benefits of drinking water instead of sugary drinks when you have communities where you don't have access to water. So that's where the education can have like a collision, a crash with the reality. And so we need to engage all policymakers uh, in the prevention of not only these, but other non-communicable diseases. Thank you, Anna. And then we'll have Stephanie, Pierre and Nimal. Stephanie, please. Hi. I just wanted to echo and reiterate what Anna said because she cut the nail on the head. We really need an all of government approach when addressing non-communicable diseases. And it, stems, it starts at the Ministry of Health, but it doesn't end there. We need Ministry of Education, Finance, Ministries of Agriculture and Forestries. We need um, uh, Ministries of Trade if it's different from Ministry of Finance because it happens at all different sectors. And in order to really create a holistic impact, we need all sectors working on the same page and working together towards one common goal. Too often have we had um, initiatives happen by only one sector, and that is where we kind of fall flat. And if government is really serious, or if agencies, decision makers are really serious about combating non communicable diseases, they all need to come at the table and we all need to have a seat at the table, all the ministries, all agencies, um, private and pub public sectors need to come together to address non-communicable diseases. That's my little two cents. I just wanted to add, just add it on to Anna's comments. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Pierre? Yes. Um, I mean, everyone basically addressed the um, key areas. One, one area I do want to highlight is the um, our ministries of legal affairs, I think one of the things that necessarily need to 
we need to look into is the use of law around protecting the uh, rights of young persons um, and the need for creating these strong legislative frameworks um, for the protection of the rights of young people. So that speaks to um, trade policies um, and how the law can necessarily channel or influence what policies are put in place. Um, and, and necessarily since our governments for the most part have committed to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, there's a legal obligation to necessarily protect those rights, which means putting um, in place those necessary legislations, policies that speaks to the protection of the right to the highest attainable standard of health. So what that would mean is that our governments have a duty to introduce policies that um, speak to the prevention of predatory marketing. Um, our ministries of education will understand they have a responsibility to look at the um, proper food and nutrition policies within our schools. Um, beyond those policy um, recommendations, uh, governments will understand that they have a social and legal responsibility um, to ensure that all the rights of young persons and children are protected. So that speaks to the wider framework of health, what they need to do to ensure there's the highest attainable standard of health care, access to health services. It speaks to differently able persons. So when we look at that legislative framework, when we look at the legal system, I think that's a brilliant way for us to bolster our um, advocacy. Uh, there's a comment I made just recently uh, at a seminar that you can't legislate health, but you can put the necessary laws in, in place to protect um, health. So there can be legislation in place. We can look into at the base, at its core, human rights and children's rights, I think are the strongest foundations for any advocacy movement. And when we learn to make the connections between rights and access to them, um, and the gaps within that access to it, I think we have a great space to um, continue our advocacy. Thank you, Pierre. Nima? Uh, coming back to what Pierre and Stephanie, as well as other the level commitment, um, as uh, um, Shakira mentioned at, this, uh, at the beginning, that high level policy commitment is what drives everything so uh, when we live in an uh, in the modern day democracy we are always uh, faced with uh, a political situation that might not be uh, agreeable on all different government levels so we need to have a high level political commitment for all our policies to work and that to be translated to all the government agencies and non-governmental agencies. And we are all working towards achieving this a common single goal. So most of the time, what we see in country levels are that uh, a, a new government might come into power and they might have uh, policies that are being uh, laid down. But uh, uh, as youth, we can raise the voice and or as uh, NCD advocates, we should be raising that voice and saying, are these aligned to the current practices or best practices that's in place or uh, set by the uh, UN organizations and others who are working for the NCD agenda? Thank you. Thanks, Mal. Shakira? So three quick points, only because I'm burning in my seat to talk about this as I heard the question and, and hearing others speak. So I think the, the one is that all sectors need to be involved. So I think something that works really well that I'm seeing in Eastern and Southern Africa with some of the HIV work that I do is how do we create multi-sectoral coordination mechanisms uh, for NCDs in our countries and in the region? That's, that would be a key. Um, then to be big and bold, I think, yes, we have all the ministries, but if we really want to put issues on the agenda for the country. We've got to go right to the president or the prime ministers. And at least in the African continent is we have ministries of youth which are politically charged, which do not serve young people, do not respond to the needs of young people. And I think that's a key ministry for us to target. Um, and also what's concerning within ministries of youth is that health issues feature very uh, low on the bar. Sometimes it's just a paragraph in a national youth policy. So I'm going to stop there before I carry on all day about this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll take the last question, question, which is from Deanna McGee. And it is, how do our young people view commercial, commercial semblance of health? And what do you recommend we do differently to make real change? And these will be very quick answers because then we'll go over to the final reflection from Fale in a couple of minutes.
but I'm sure some of you want to answer this question. Otherwise, I might ask Anna to speak a bit. Hi. Yeah, I was just rereading the question. Um, well, I think something interesting in our experience is that uh, in Mexico, we have a groundbreaking initiative on nutrition policies, and it came from young people uh, in the nutrition field. Um, and it is a, a code uh, that young professionals can subscribe in order to protect the policy making and the evidence making from commercial interests. So I think, of course, this is not like a mandatory code or anything, but it's youth led. And I thought it was very interesting how um, it can become a movement of, uh, you know, young professionals um, claiming that they will not receive and they will not endorse any uh, industry related uh, positions uh, because of the health damages that they have improved to cause. So I think this is like a very specific example, but there are many other ways in which youth can involve uh, in protecting health above uh, commercial interest. And the first thing, and it was previously mentioned, is by uh, pointing it out and raising it and saying, um, how can it affect uh, the population health? Um, I believe that youth is very well aware of it. Uh, that's what I've seen, at least uh, at the national level. Um, and I think it is part of the new way of, of thinking about our resources, the, the damages that we have seen that, you know, uh, unregulated uh, corporation can cause to both our planet and our health. Um, and we are going to begin looking into younger uh, generations of people that are each time more aware of it. Uh, so I don't know if anyone wants to add on to this. Thank you so much, and I really think that that was very insightful and interesting to hear that specific example. A brief comment from Pierre? Uh, yeah, just very quickly. I think uh, with the commercial determinants, one of the things that we see is that um, major corporations, especially during the last year with COVID-19, they were signaling virtue in their enterprises. So um, they created themselves to be uh, family-oriented organizations and interested in the protection of health. Um, very, very interested and deeply um, disturbed by COVID-19 and its impact on the health of people, whilst also advertising their um, unhealthy foods and beverages and e-cigarettes and stuff to the same persons that are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. I think what is necessary is that we not only sit back and say, oh, I see this and I know what they're doing, but us to signal our outrage to these activities so that not only us who are aware of it can notice what they're doing, but persons who may be um, oblivious to what's happening can as well mark and see that this is, you know, some dubious practices by these organizations and necessarily show that the linkage, show the linkages between this advertising, this product, um, this type of marketing, these trade policies and your health. So it's not enough for us to, as youth advocates to notice it and keep it to ourselves or use it in our advocacy, but necessarily we need to signal our outrage so that persons understand that they need to, to they need as well to flag these, um, these activities by major corporations. Thanks a lot, Pierre. And now over to you, Fale, for final reflections and goodbye and also goodbye from me. And thank you everyone for, for joining us and being part of this a very uh, inspiring webinar. Thing. Fale? Thank you very much, Marie. If I had to tell my mother about this midnight Zoom call, I would probably tell her that young people are asking for more responsibility. They're asking for people to give them the trust that they need to co-design, to co-create, to co-lead. Uh, programs for young people in healthcare. They want a healthcare system that's more resilient, a healthcare system that's more inclusive, and a healthcare system that takes into account equity and fairness. And above all, I think young people are agile and they're versatile and they're creative and they're risk taking. And that's the key. I think young people can get away with more than others. And when we realize the value of that, our options are endless. So take advantage of your youth, take advantage of COVID-19 and what that represents in terms of the future of healthcare. Healthcare has never been more prominent on the agenda because of COVID-19. So what does that look like for champions on the ground, for champions on the field, 
Thank you for sharing some of your best practices with us today. You are the reason that we have come so far in NCD prevention. You are the reason that we will continue to go even further because of the legacies that you leave behind. So uh, to our young leaders in particular, thank you for being here. To our partners and stakeholders who also spoke, thank you for giving us your time. And of course, to Marie and the team, thank you for being so generous uh, in selecting me as a facilitator or a moderator. I think it's great that we have Indigenous people in these um, visible spaces. So thank you for, for bearing with me today. Uh, my key takeaway is that the future is very bright if these are the people leading uh, the future of uh, NCD prevention. So I'm very optimistic and full of energy at four o'clock in the morning uh, because of what I've just heard. And I think the future is in a very safe pair of hands. So I wish everyone every success. Uh, keep up the good, uh, the good work and stay connected, stay in touch. That's the only way we will succeed together. And for those who want more information on NCD Child's Youth Programme, it will be on our website. Thank you in particular to our sponsors, Friends of Cancer Patients and AstraZeneca. And thank you to Marie and the team at NCD Child. Uh, thank you everyone for being so generous with uh, your learning today. I think we've all taken at least something away that will be meaningful and of value. So for me and New Zealand, uh, thank you very much indeed and take care. All the best. <laughs>